You know what makes Smash Bros more than just a game? Nope, it's not advanced techniques, it's not the huge cast of characters, it's not the code inside the game, it's the community outside of it. Smash Bros is the embodiment of a community effort, something that lives due to the passion of so many people who love it and give it a lot of their time. So let's switch gears a bit and talk about some of the colorful characters you see out of the game. That's right, we're talking about the types of Smashers you're going to meet at tournaments. If you're seeing the in-game characters after you turn the switch off, then you've been playing too much Smash and you need to see a doctor. If you've been following us for a while, you know this is a follow-up to two videos we made earlier this summer. This time, we're stepping up our game and bringing you eight more types of Smashers you can find out there in the real world. And remember, if you haven't gotten out there and gone to a tournament yet, you definitely should. Your local tournament helps keep the Smash scene alive and a few things fuel improvement like face-to-face -face competition. Speaking of fueling improvement, if you're looking to get better at Smash, be sure to check out ProGuides.com in just one day. You're going to be able to beat MKLeo. All right, I'm kidding. Kidding. Okay. But we're serious about helping you improve, and we do that with specific character guides, coaching services, and Smash courses from great players like Zero and MKLeo. Speaking of pros, our first smasher is the eSports Obsessor. This player doesn't just watch streams, they subscribe, they drop bits, and might just be spamming in Twitch chat right now. The eSports Obsessor looks forward to the weekend because that means there's another Smash tournament to watch. With how wild and exciting Smash's competitive scene can get, it's hard to blame them. But sometimes, the eSports Obsessor can go a little too far. They might just talk your ear off about their favorite regional player, or about how genius MKLeo's empty hopping is, or how busted ESAM's Pikachu is, or about how they're rooting for Nairobi. By the way, Nairobi is Nairo. The eSports obsessor can use his first name because they're tight like that. Sometimes they're living a little too much on Twitch.tv, okay, and can even show in their gameplay. Like when they go for some of those pro edge guards that they're not really ready for. Ultimately, the eSports Obsessor gets hyped to see the art that the top professionals can make just by picking up the controller. It's hard to fault them for that. Their passion can make them knowledgeable too, and they can often tell you about a niche player on the fly. They can be pretty fun to talk to because they might know some things about your favorite player that even you didn't know. Now let's meet the eSports Obsessor's closest relative, the Smash Obsessor. For this player, Smash is life. When they're at work, they're thinking about Smash. When they're making dinner, they're thinking about Smash. When they're not thinking about Smash, they're dreaming about Smash because they're asleep. <laughs> that might seem pretty crazy at first glance, but a lot of us have hobbies, passions, and even careers that we get a little too involved in. And you might be surprised how easy it can be to become totally Smash obsessed. It's one of the most popular games in the world, so there's pretty much always something Smash related to watch or do. The Smash Obsessor watches tournaments, goes to locals, grinds their characters, scans Twitter for new tech, and likes pretty much every facet of the game. They may get way into the game, but their passion isn't necessarily unhealthy. Lots of times the Smash Obsessor has a great social circle inside the Smash community and a great attitude for improving because they love the game so much. The Smash Obsessor can be fun to talk and play with since they just plain like the game and all the things that come with it. If we're talking about getting really into it, then we gotta talk about the extra. In the world of cinema, the extra is the person you didn't notice. In the world of Smash, the exact opposite is true. The extra is the person with the strongest reactions in the room. When they lose, you can expect an extra large sigh, at the very least, if not a full chair slump or head shake. When they win, you better get that fist bump in quick because a pop-off is a coming. The extra might seem like they're trying to put on a show, but they're probably just an emotional person. When you've got those strong emotions, sometimes you just have to let them out a little more than most people do. And Smash is going to get you emotional sometimes. Fighting games can genuinely be the most tilting games on the planet. Even if the extra can be a little too much sometimes, you gotta love them because they pop off for their friends too and they bring the energy and color to the tournament. Remember how fighting games get you emotional? Is Salt an emotion? For the Salt Lord, Salt isn't just an emotion, it's a way of life. The Salt Lord lets off steam by complaining about the many annoying things your character or her character or his character or their character does. The Salt Lord will complain about features you didn't even know were in the game. Even though they're complaining, a lot of times the Salt Lord is still having fun. They enjoy a good challenge like anybody else, it's just that they enjoy complaining a bit more than most. Like the John or the Scrub, the Salt Lord can be frustrating to face and go too far sometimes. But unlike the John or the Scrub, the Salt Lord isn't trying to dismiss their loss or take away from your win. They're just blowing off steam that builds up naturally in competition. And let's face it, we've all got a little Salt Lord inside of us. If you've seen Smash Twitter, you know that's twice as true for Smashers. Whether it's Palutena or Rob or Game and Watch or Snake, there's probably a matchup that'll wake up the salt inside of you. Oh man, Whew. I'm getting flashbacks to when my friend made D2D for a month. 
Now let's talk gameplay. Remember the walking character crisis? Their foil is the character loyalist. The character loyalists had no trouble finding a main. Back when they were playing Smash 64, they found their main early, like way early, and they will die for that main, literally. They will die and bracket to a god-awful matchup before they change. But don't feel bad for the loyalists, they found love in the polygons and they never looked back. Sure, all those nerfs hit them harder than they would most of us, but the buffs feel twice as good too. A lot of times, character loyalists don't just like the playstyle and feel of a character, but even like their games, their animations, and even their sound design. That's what makes their passion for the character go so deep. And you gotta respect that passion. The character loyalists are the ones pushing their boundaries on their main and making sure that all those discords have something to talk about. Without character loyalists, you see a lot less movement along the tier list too. The loyalists either see their potential in their mid or low tier or have too much fun with them to care about tiers. Either way, they're the ones that adapt rather than avoid and they show us a character's true potential. If your character can show your personality, so can your playstyle. Let's talk about the camper. Despite the name, this player isn't intense at all, okay? <laughs> you get it? Like, intense, but tense. Okay, you know what? I'll stop. The camper is a player that has a super campy defensive style. They don't like to approach a lot, and they won't often go for those super risky plays, but they are super optimal and suffocating to play against. The camper will lock in a tough to pin down character with great defensive options and spend the whole game making you miss and make mistakes. This player has incredible patience and they will time you out. You can find campers at all levels of play and at pretty much every tournament, and that makes them great sparring partners. But wait, you're saying that doesn't sound fun to play against. Not always, but it is fun to beat. If you want to get good placings in Ultimate, you need to understand and be able to beat camping. Who better to teach you the ways of the camp than the camper? Besides, camping can lead to more hype moments than you think, and pretty much every character can camp and make use of defensive tactics. Besides, it's better than losing to the Mango Lights. At the opposite end of camp is Reckless Aggression, and that's where the Mango Light is. A Mango Light is just as suffocating as the camper, except with relentless aggression instead of defense. Getting wrecked by the Mango Light is getting tech chased and comboed so hard, you basically don't get to move for 30 seconds. What's worse? The Mango Light really wants to style on you. They want to do some ridiculous quick play stuff like spiking you after you're already dead. When the Mango Light lands a good combo on you, there's a 50-50 chance that it's going to end up on YouTube or Reddit. There's a 100% chance that they're going to be so super smug about what they just put off. Oh my goodness, can we go back to camping? It bugged me a lot less. Get it? Bugs? <laughs> camping, you know. Alright, whatever. I'll see myself out. But the truth is, is that Smash just wouldn't be Smash without the overly aggressive players and the overly defensive players, just like the camper. The aggro players will help you learn the game and valuable parts of neutral too. You might end up on the highlight reel, but you know that the mango light is going to give you the respect when you put them on yours. Last but definitely not least, ladies and gentlemen, we have the Prodigy. We're not talking about the SoCal Mario main. Wait, actually, we kind of are. You know that teenager who gets dropped off at the venue by their mom? Hmm. The one that's doing homework before a bracket and looking at memes that are incomprehensible to you? Yeah, that teenager is a prodigy and is about to body you. Prodigies are more integral to Smash than you may think. A lot of Smash biggest figures, players, commentators, content creators started off as young talents. Mango, MKLeo, Nairo, Hungrybox, the plant main you saw at Smash and Splash. Smash has lots of prodigies. It makes sense if you think about it. What better time to spend the whole day playing games than when you're a kid and you don't have to think about your rent, career, relationships, and all the adult stuff. Kids also learn most skills faster than adults, so kids are better at getting good. Chances are, even in a small scene, you can find a prodigy. Prodigies create a ton of hype and regional pride and often represent the next wave of great players and god slayers. Since a prodigy is just a teenager who's good, they don't have the same kind of unifying personality. Some prodigies could be salt lords or very extra or campers or mango lights. You never know, but they are important to Smash. Don't forget the next generation. All right, that wraps up another eight types of Smashers you're gonna meet at tournaments. What do you think? Have you seen any of them? Did we miss any? What kind of Smasher are you? Let us know in the comments. And remember to get out there and go to a tournament or two so you can meet them yourself. After all, without the Smash community, Smash would be just another game, like PlayStation All-Stars or something. 